I want to recommend to you and tell you in case you should not know that the great boycott is over and that and that grapes are really very healthy and very good for you and that and that if you and if you eat, that if you eat grapes you'll create more jobs for us and that we need but also I have to admit that the growers were right and we were wrong when they accused us that if they used to say a few years back today grapes what tomorrow and they used to say that we'll boycott grapes today and tomorrow there'll be something else and after tomorrow something else and so not to disappoint them we are boycotting lettuce non-union lettuce that that it's the it's the western iceberg lettuce the one that looks like lettuce, lettuce. Looks like a cabbage. And it's really bad these days. So if you don't see the black eagle, if you don't see the black eagle, don't take any chances. Don't eat it. Proposition 22 has only one reason for being. You see, when the strike started in Delano back in 1965, the employers were very sure that that strike would be broken as so many strikes have been broken in the last 70 or 80, 90 years. And they were right. They were right. Had it not been for the boycott, we'd still be uh, struggling to get the union built. When we left the fields to go on the boycott, the employers also went following us. And we went to the people of this country, and we said in whichever way we could, with leaflets, going to meetings, to students, to union meetings, to church meetings, and everywhere and anywhere that we have us, that they would have us, and we told the people in America, help us, we need your help. And they responded. And the employers came right after us, but they went to the public in a little different way. They went through slick, uh, political or slick paid advertisement and we beat them and after they after they found out that we could actually get people to boycott in this country the only thing left for them to do was to come up with proposition 22 that would essentially strip all those rights away from us and your rights to help us if it should be enacted they took Proposition 22 right after we won the strike in Delano in July of 1970 and went to the halls of Congress in Washington and tried to peddle that, that piece of legislation and only one old tired senator took it on. Only one old tired senator accepted and became sort of the champion. And of course he was retired. Uh, year, in fact he was retired I think that same year. He used to be your senator. And when they found that this piece of legislation was laughed at and was rejected soundly in the halls of Congress, then the American Farm Bureau, some, a collection of some extreme right-wing groups, which to this day we don't understand, we just don't understand why we are on the, on the number one list in their, in their uh, bad, bad list of people in this country. But anyway, and the National Right to Work Committee and assorted groups made a promise that they would go to every state in the country to have 22 enacted through the state legislatures. And they've been to 37 states, and we've defeated them in every state except three. Kansas has Proposition 22 enacted as a law. So, is, so does Idaho, and so does Arizona. All three incidentally are right to work states and so in Arizona we made up our minds that we we're going to fight back the best way we could and we told the governor in Arizona Governor Williams if you sign that piece of, of bias unconstitutional repressive legislation 
we're going to fight you back and we're going to do it in such a way you're not going to like it very well. We're going to recall you. And he laughed and the two major newspapers in Arizona wrote articles making fun of the farm workers and we started the work in early June of this year. We needed 103,000 signatures to recall him. We now have 112,000 signatures. When we went to Maricopa County, where Phoenix is situated, we talked to the Black Brothers and the Chicanos and the Indians and the White Brothers who wanted to work with us, and we said, we'd like to do something to get our program going. Can you help? And the suggestion that they made was that we register voters, and we did. Together with them, when we came into Phoenix, there were 13,000 more Republicans and Democrats. Right now, there are about 60,000 more Democrats and Republicans. And most of those, most of those are the Chicanos and the Blacks and Indians in that area. And we went to every Indian reservation. Went to, the, we made a one-month trip in Arizona visiting the Indian reservations, the farm workers, all of the cities, all of the colleges, all the universities, everywhere and anywhere they would have us. But we went to... Flagstaff right after July 4th and found out that there was a three-day fiesta, powwow they call it, where a lot, thousands and thousands of tourists come to see the Indians dance. And in this particular fiesta, or powwow, some of the young Indians from the American Indian movement got up took the mic away from the speaker and told the Indian brothers and sisters, do not denigrate your religion, do not dance. And they were arrested, there were seven of them, they were charged with crossing a state line to incite to, to, incite to riot. We went to the judge, the local judge is a Chicano, or at least, I think he just has a Chicano name, I'm sure he's not a Chicano. And I said, man, this is so, so ridiculous. How can you arrest those seven men? Because they, they took a mic away from the, from the speaker. I'm sure it could never be a, fenalty, uh, a felony. And it would be very difficult to conscrew taking a microphone away from, from someone as a misdemeanor. The most we could, we could uh, agree on would probably be some inconvenience. But nevertheless, he was arrested. So we spoke to a rally of people out at the outskirts of town because no one would rent us a hall and we just told the judge and the city fathers that if they, these guys were not released or they, if those charges were not brought we were going to bring our friends from all over the country and they believed it and a few hours later the charges were dropped to misdemeanor and they were out on a $50 fine and then we found out that they had arrested 667 Indians on the three-day powwow and when we complained, the judge told us that it was really not that bad because last year they had arrested 878. And we found out that they keep them in jail for three days and they use them as free slave labor to clean up all of the stuff that all of the streets after the, after the powwow and then they release them without bail. That's Arizona politics for you. We went to the Navajo Indian Reservation, the largest reservation in the country and we found out that 2,700 Navajos had registered, registered to vote in 1970, the largest number ever in that reservation. We found out that some of those families had to travel 130 miles to a polling place. Today there are over 35,000 registered to vote and they ain't gonna travel 130 miles to go to a polling place, I, I can assure you that. And so there'll be a recall election, not on November the 7th. The governor called, called us about a week and a half ago and suggested that to have the recall election, since we already have the signatures, on November the 7th, because in this way it would save the state $500,000. And we considered his proposal for 15 minutes and calling back we told him we too, were, were, we too were interested in saving money and suggested if he really wanted to save money for the state, why not resign?
Proposition 22 sticks to do only one thing. They want to take the strike and the boycott away from the Farm Workers Union as the as a way to stop our progress and to eventually destroy the union. The employers want nothing, the growers want nothing more than that. The way that they've got Proposition 22 written says that there should be no strikes at harvest time for 60 days. There should be a 60-day injunction given to an employer on ex parte basis, if he goes, he gets the injunction, and we don't even have to be present to defend our interests for 60 days. And one wonders, why not 43 days or 44 days or 39 days or 10 days instead of 60 days? Of 192 crops that are grown in California, 98% of those crops, major or minor crops, are harvested within 45 days. So you see now, why 60 days? If a group of workers in Coachella Valley, grape workers, were to want to strike in Coachella Valley, they could be enjoined for, six, for 60 days, two months. The same workers would move over to Bakersfield, Arb, and Lamont area. The same workers, different employers. They wanted to strike there to build a union, they'd be enjoined for another two months. This is uh, four months now. The same workers, which is the same workforce, goes to Delano, they can be enjoined for another 60 days, another two months, that's now six months. And the same group of workers can go to Fresno, be enjoined for another two months. If they go to Olives and to, and to Oranges, that's it, that's a whole year. So in fact, Proposition 22 seeks to destroy the union by outlawing the strike, the right of workers to strike forever. There's no set of workers in the country they are being penalized this way. No set of workers. And we're not complaining. We hope, we're, we're happy and grateful that other workers still have the right to strike, but they're trying to take it away from us. Then they move over to the other thing that they want. They want to do away with the boycott. They want to do away with the boycott because we have demonstrated to them that we can go out to the masses of people in this country and that the majority of the people in this country do care about the underdog, do care about injustices, and have demonstrated in a very direct way that they want to help us. Not only the people in this country, but people throughout the world. In the great, long, great boycott, we experienced some of the greatest acts of charity towards the farm workers. A friend of mine traveling through Hong Kong came back to Delano all excited at the end of 1969 to tell me that he'd been in Hong Kong and he had gone to a small fruit stand and right in front of that very small fruit stand was a Chinese man with a picket sign and on one side of that picket sign there were some characters my friend doesn't know Chinese he thought they were Chinese characters but on the other side of that sign wearing plain old English the following message, do not eat California grapes. Or the, or the case in London, a member of the Transport Workers Union, his family and his two teenage daughters picketing in front of a store, one of the vice presidents who had been there to attend a, a congress of the World Council of Churches, came upon them, he was going to go into the store, he was stopped, and they explained to him all about the boycott and why he shouldn't buy, eat grapes, why, should, why he shouldn't go into that store, and the whole background of the strike. Can you imagine that? Or perhaps the best story yet is a little girl in Washington, D.C., that I tell so often because it, it points to us that, that people do want to help. Back in the beginning of the boycott, this particular family in Washington, D.C., a young couple was buried together with a strike and the boycott. And, and so in that household, there was all the talk about boycott grapes, do not eat grapes, help the farm workers, the well done, and so forth. And uh, soon after the little girl was born, four and a half years later, the mother was at a supermarket in Washington, D.C. 
doing her shopping. She was going through the aisle with a little girl with her, and they came, they went, they came upon a display of grapes, and the mother was, of course, ignoring the grapes going by, but the little girl stopped and pulled her dress and asked her, Mommy, when are you going to buy me some boycotts? And so Proposition 22 wants to prevent that little girl and our brother Chinese in Hong Kong and the people in London and people throughout this country the right to help us have a union. Because Proposition 22 states clearly and specifically that there shall be no boycotts of any sort, including no boycotts by trade name. And they go to the ridiculous just to make very, very sure that nobody misses the point there shall be no, no boycotts by generic name. And so it would be illegal to ask you to, boy, to boycott lettuce if Proposition 22 should pass. And so not to take any chances, I'm asking you right now before, God forbid, it becomes law, vote non-22 and don't eat lettuce. Boycott lettuce, boycott lettuce, and boycott lettuce. Then the employers come back, then the growers come back, and they have one problem. They've been saying that our union does not represent the workers' interest, that the workers do not want the union, and that we're afraid of elections. And that could be nothing, that could be probably the biggest falsehood that they've ever perpetrated, because you see, most unions today in the United States organize through elections and not through strikes and boycotts. And do you think we want to be tied up in a strike and a boycott for five years where we can decide the whole issue in maybe an election in 30 days? We too want elections, but we don't want elections under their own, under their own rules. Proposition 22 is sugar-coated. In order to take the strike and the boycott away from us, the growers are telling the public, yeah, but it's going to give the workers a right to a free election. And we say nonsense. This is how free the elections are. First of all, an employ a farm worker cannot be considered a farm worker with rights to vote unless he has worked 100 days in any one geographic area the previous year. And that would eliminate a whole bunch of workers. But that's not all. Also states that a worker cannot vote more than once in any 12-month period. So consider this problem. A group of workers working in grapes for some great miracle. I know we'll never get to an election under 22, but supposing we did, for the, for the sake of explaining it to you, supposing that there was election in grapes for farm workers in the, in the summer, the same group of workers move over to olives in the fall. It's different crop, different employers but the same workers. Those workers could not vote in, uh, to have an election in a union in Olives because they voted, they voted in the summer in grapes. And if the same workers, as is the case, should move over then to citrus in the winter. They could, a different crop, different employers, they still couldn't vote on the Proposition 22 because they voted in the summer in grapes. And if the same workers, as is the case, would go to field crops, would go to row crops, beans, and peace and so forth in the, in the, in the uh, spring of the following year, and they wanted to have a union with different employers, different crops, they couldn't vote. It would be against the law under 22 to vote because they voted the previous summer for grapes. And just to make sure that all bases are covered, doubly covered, then they come with probably the most ridiculous qualification for voting. States that there shall be no elections at any time when the amount of migratory and seasonal workers outnumber the number, outnumber the, the permanent workers in any ranch. 5% of the workforce in California is permanent. 95% is either migratory because it migrates inter or intrastate and the other, and the other part of it is seasonal workers that live there, don't move, but they do not work as steady, steady year-round workers. And that's the kind of election procedures that the employers want to give us 
but that's only sugarcoating because they really don't want to give us a right to elections, the right to have a free election in the union. What they want is to take the strike and the boycott away from us and then sugarcoat it and try to fool the public that in fact they're giving us a free election when in fact they're not. And so, brothers and sisters, if there should be a great two miracles in one season and we got through all of those rigged elections, and I'm sure we wouldn't, but just for the sake of explaining, and we made it to the negotiating table, in big bold letters in Proposition 22, it states clearly that the union has no right to negotiate on pesticides. We are in the vanguard of the whole question of pesticides. Our union outlawed DDT before the British government did, and way before our own country did, in our first contracts. And they're saying now that we don't have the right to protect our members, and we don't have the right to be concerned about you who eat the pesticides in those vegetables and in those fruits. Proposition 22 also states that we have no right to negotiate on anything except wages and working conditions directly related to the job, to the specific job that that farm worker may be doing. As an example, if a group of workers are working at this field and a crop dusting plane is a few yards from them and spraying and the wind is going towards the farm workers and the drift is harming the workers, we could not negotiate about that plane because that plane happens not to be piloted by a farm worker. It's the most vicious, atrocious piece of legisl anti-labor legislation that has been introduced in the history of California. It's also, a, it's also the beginning of a right to work uh, law. But supposing that it would pass, now they also have provisions to do away, to, to met out sentences if you break the law. If I break the law as a union leader or the workers or you as supporters, you're subject to one year in jail and up to $5,000 fine. But if the employers break the law, if the growers break the law, the only thing that they're subject to is an unfair labor practice with no penalties attached to it. It's ridiculous. I don't see how in the world this piece of legislation could be passed. But they have reportedly a million and a half dollars that they're going to be dumping in this area about two weeks before the elections. See, we can't reach the people like they can. We've got to go to you, and we've got to depend for you to reach the people for us. Brothers and sisters, to conclude, I want to leave you with one thought. You know, you are really not that far from the farm workers. Every time, three times a day that you get around that table, you are partaking from their sacrifices, and you're partaking whatever you eat with the exception of grapes. You're eating something that, that has gotten to your table with an awful lot of exploitation, a lot of suffering, a lot of traveling, a lot of injustice. And so we say that you're not really that far. And you know the farm workers for generations, they travel from the, the black worker travels in large numbers from Florida and up the east coast all the way to the northeast. And they know before they leave that by the time they get back, they're gonna be as broke as when they left. They know there's nothing in it for them. And the Chicano and the Filipino and the Puerto Rican and the and the uh, Cuban and the other immigrants travel in the in the uh, Southwest, and they know when they leave their homes that they're going to be just as broke when they get back. And they still go out and harvest those crops and plant them and cultivate them. You know why? I think they do it because they understand that they have a tremendous sense of mission. Although they go, they get nothing for themselves. Farm labor as it is today who feeds all of you and all of us. The whole country and part of the world, they know that they've got a tremendous responsibility whether they get anything for them or not to feed you and to keep you well in the life. Isn't it tragic that the same men and women who harvest, who plant and cultivate and harvest uh, the greatest abundance of food that the world has ever known, when it's all said and done and when the land 
his slave followed to rest and they look at themselves and they have no food for themselves. And this is really tragic. And so they're saying to you through me, as we feed you and fed you for generations, please help us feed ourselves. Please vote no on 22 so we can have a union. Thank you very much.